understand last night, I didn't know this, obviously. Um, I never had any conversation about tweaking something or not. And uh, oddly enough, I guess I talked to Dean and Dean and Dean and one preached on John 14, one John 16 or something last week. So I guess I'm picking up where they forgot and left off. Uh, I skipped John chapter 15. I don't know if they know it's there or not. Uh, praise God. In John chapter 15. And a uh, while back here, just, you know, as uh, I was there in Kentucky, the Lord really just seemed kind of dropped in my heart to, to teach through John chapter 15 and to preach through John chapter 15. And there was one aspect of it as I began to look at it for today's teaching that, that really kind of surprised me how much the Lord was putting that upon my heart. And, uh, but John chapter 15 is uh, a chapter that Jesus presents himself as a vine and tells us that the father is the husbandman or the gardener would probably be a better way of us understanding that, the farmer. And talks about bearing fruit or not bearing fruit. And uh, it's always been one of the chapters that I love to just, for my own time, I'm just sitting down and just want some time with the Lord, some devotional time. That's one of my favorite chapters in the Bible that I go to. And uh, just to chew on, to meditate on. I've done some teaching out of it. I don't think I've ever just, you know, did like I'm going to do now and do it, just like a verse by verse teaching through John chapter 15. Uh, but it deals with abiding in Christ. And as I said, as the Lord put on my heart, I was kind of surprised by the urgency that I sensed in the Spirit about teaching John chapter 15. And I was kind of surprised about the heaviness, so to speak, about it. Because normally it's, it's one of those chapters that's really just kind of a devotional, encouraging chapter. There's aspects of it that I believe the Lord would want us to really focus on and to talk about that, that may stir you up a little bit, hopefully. Amen? Uh, but John chapter 15, we're going to begin in verse number 1. And uh, Jesus starts out by saying, I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. So if you'll notice there, when Jesus says, he, when Jesus describes himself, he doesn't say that he's the vine. He says he's the true vine. The true vine. The real vine. The genuine vine. The authentic vine. The ideal vine. Or the perfect vine. And one of the first examples that we should understand here is he's probably at this point in time very much also comparing himself with Israel, who he's preaching to at this time. Because in the, in the Old Testament, like for example, in Isaiah chapter 5, God refers to Israel as, as, as being a vine that brings forth wild grapes. And uh, that he's done everything he can. He's, he's watered that, that garden, so to speak. He's, he's, he's pruned it as it's needed. But no matter what he's done, as a matter of fact, he says, what else can I do? What more could I possibly have done? for Israel, and they brought forth wild grapes. They haven't brought forth a true harvest as, as he's looked for them to do. And it's kind of odd, but again, if we look at those verses, and, and you don't have to turn there now, but if you want to read them later, uh, what I'm referring to comes out of Isaiah chapter 5, and the first few verses there. But what he does, because they haven't brought forth fruit, he says he's going to take away the hedge. And, and the reason that's so fascinating is because a lot of times we don't understand how God does things and how God acts and how he does things. But here he says, he will take away the hedge. And if you remember, like, there's been times people have come to me, and I remember for some reason, when we, we, in particular, years ago when that hurricane hit New Orleans, for some reason, that particular hurricane seemed to stir up a lot of questions <coughs> in people's minds. And I have a lot of people ask me, you know, you're a pastor, even some of the people in church maybe say, you know, did, did God do that to New Orleans, or did the devil do that to New Orleans? And my answer was basically neither. I mean, we live in a cursed world. It's full of storms, isn't it? We live in a cursed world. It's full of hurricanes, isn't it? You see, the question is not, did God do that to them, or did the devil do that to them? The real question is, where was the hedge of protection? Because we live in a cursed world. And the thing we need to be understand is where is our hedge of protection? And that's what it talks about when it talks about Israel there and, as, and, and bringing forth bad fruit. God removes the hedge of protection from them. And he takes away the hedge of protection and, and then that garden gets devoured. And so we've got to understand something here. When we're looking at these things, 
And it's important to understand that when we understand how things happen in this world, beloved, we need to ask, where's our hedge of protection? And there's a lot there that we can learn about that. You know, that's what the Satan's accusation was against Job, that God had put a hedge of protection around him and blessed everything he did. And it's kind of fascinating. I did just a little bit of study about this. And, you know, we know Psalm 91, where when we dwell in the secret place of the Most High, we're dwelling in that, that hedge of protection. You go through Psalm 91, nothing can harm us. Nothing can really come against us then because we've got that hedge of protection that we're covered by. We're walking in that covering of the Lord because we dwell in the secret place of the Most High. But there's also, I believe it was Ezekiel chapter 3, if I remember right, really a, a fascinating thing there, an interesting thing there. One of the accusations that God makes against the false prophets is they have not stood in the gap and they have not created a hedge of protection through their prayers and their intercessions. And so we know as intercessors, as prayer warriors, one of the things we do when we pray for people, we're praying a hedge of protection around them. And so we've got to understand when we look at these things, I, I, you know, and this is just a little bit of a, a sidestep here, but we're going to come back to it here very shortly and understand why, that, that when, when God deals with something, a lot of times that hedge of protection is just taken away. And it's just like, you know, we say, God, I want to do this way, I want to do my way, and I want to do this, and God says, that's fine. He just kind of steps back and says, you're on your own, go for it. See how it works out for you. See how I can do without that hedge of protection around you. See how you do without my, without my protection and without my covering. And that's what had taken place with Israel. And Jesus is standing there saying, I am the true vine. And in the understanding, he probably compared himself to Israel who had not brought forth fruit. And because Israel did not bring forth fruit, God removed the hedge of protection from them. And they were devoured right down the road here. They're wiped out. They're devastated. Why? Because, because the head of God's head of protection is taken away. And they don't have any protection. Because they didn't bear fruit. And Jesus says, I'm the true vine. I'm the true vine. You see, that's one of the things we're going to look at this morning, beloved. And, and I want you really to tune in your ears here and listen to this very closely. Because we're going to talk about bearing fruit or not bearing fruit in a very serious manner, in a very serious way. Because, you know, one of the things we learned there when Jesus says, I'm the true vine, and we compare him to Israel that did bring forth fruit, and we understand something, God has a program here. And one aspect of God sometimes we don't necessarily look at, as we see it here in John chapter 15, God has a program here, and he doesn't always bear with us. He told his, he told his disciples, he said, when you go into the community and you preach the gospel to them, if they don't receive it, what do you do? You shake the dust from your feet and move on. And we know later on in Acts chapter 13, when, when, when it's very plain, it, it really brought forth, that they were brought forth the gospel, and they brought it forth to the Israelites, and they didn't receive it, and they very plainly said in the scripture, by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, God said, I'm moving on to the Gentiles now. So we have examples, clear-cut examples in the Word of God, very plain, very solid examples, where that which doesn't bear fruit, God moves on from. Let that sink in for a moment. We have very clear-cut, plain examples in the Word of God where that which does not bear fruit, God moves on from. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. Say, I need to wake up and listen to the pastor this morning. I need to tune in because God's got something for me this morning. God's got a word for me. God's trying to get my attention this morning. God's trying to get through to me about something because the Spirit of God is heavy upon this message, beloved. And I'm trying to tell you that there's an urgency about what I'm sharing with you this morning. If you got awake, I'd stand up and stay awake. In all seriousness, God wants to talk to you this morning. God's got a word for you this morning. Not because I'm the one preaching it, because I know the Holy Spirit. I know when the Spirit of God is speaking to us. There is a time in the Word of God, we're well ready to examine something, where when that which does not bear fruit, God moves on from. So it be, it'd be who is to examine our lives this morning and ask ourselves a question. Is my walk with God fruit bearing? Which branch am I? Am I the branch that bears fruit? Or am I the branch that doesn't bear fruit? Because God is the gardener. Amen? Let's go back to John chapter 15. I am the true vine. 
My father is the husbandman. My father is the gardener. I'm going to ask you a question. Imagine that Andy has a garden. And big old garden. Great big giant garden. And he goes out in this garden, he gets up in the mornings, and he goes out in that garden, and he waters that garden that needs to be watered, he pulls the weeds out of that garden, and, 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 and just takes care of that garden, he does everything, makes sure that the critters don't come in, and he just harvests, and I mean, he's just out there, just, just loving and caring for that garden every minute of every day, and just watching over that garden to make sure he has a good harvest. And then we have another person that, Joe Smith is a gardener, and he plants a garden right there in the same area. Great big giant garden, just like Andy, but he doesn't ever go out there. And a little bit later, you go down and you look at that garden, you look at Joe Smith's garden, it's all weeded over. It's been a dry season, it's all dry, there's been no moisture there. Not only do the critters come in and eat, but they moved in and they're living there because there's plenty of weeds to cover them and there's plenty of food there to eat, so you walk in and the rabbits are everywhere. As a result of that, they don't have a harvest. Now, you look at both gardens, and both gardens say something about the gardener, don't they? The first one, you look at the garden where Andy's out there, and he, he's out there day and night and working hard in the garden. It says the gardener cares about the harvest. It says something positive about the gardener. It says something good about the gardener, doesn't it? When you look at the garden that Joe Smith is growing over here, and that garden that Joe Smith is growing, that says something about Joe Smith, doesn't it? It doesn't, it doesn't look well on Joe Smith. It doesn't say much about that particular gardener. Apparently he doesn't care. Apparently he's lazy. Apparently he just doesn't understand anything about gardening. In other words, the garden is a direct reflection upon the gardener, is it not? So when we look at a garden, I remember my grandfather used to, my grandmother used to grow gardens. I mean, they, they did a fine job. I mean, I don't care what they were growing, it grew good. You know, they had, they just had that back for it. I mean, whatever harvest they were looking for, they had a good harvest. But they were good gardeners. I mean, when you ate their tomatoes, you knew they cut from a good garden. They tasted good. You see, the garden is a direct reflection of the garden. You and I are a direct reflection of the garden. You're the garden. I'm the garden. I'm God's garden. You see, I use that illustration so we can understand something here. Look at John chapter 15, verse 8. Herein is my Father glorified. That you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. We are God's garden. So if we are fruitful Christians and we're living fruit-bearing lives, then we glorify our Heavenly Father. But if we're not fruitful and we're not fruit-bearing, then we don't glorify the Father. You see, beloved, what I'm trying to share with you right here, what Jesus is making very real to us, the opinion that people have about God has a lot to do with the fruit in our life. Hallelujah. The opinion that people have about God is based a lot upon the garden. And you and I are the garden. So God cares about the garden. He's very, he's very mindful about whether the garden bears fruit or not. So on the basis of this, if I can say that if I bear fruit in my life and you bear fruit in your life, it glorifies the Father. Can I ask you a simple question? Do you think God wants to bless your life and then be fruitful? Obviously he does, doesn't he? God wants to bless our lives and wants it to be fruitful. God wants us to be the branch that bears fruit. God doesn't want us to be the branch that withers up and is broken off. And take it off. So we've got to understand something, beloved. One of the things, and, and I talk about this all the time, and you hear me talk about this all the time. One of the things I think that greatly hindered Christianity was we got this idea that the goal of a Christian life was to, was to make heaven. 
And you know, people can just say, okay, just say this little sinner's prayer, say this sinner's prayer, and I'm not knocking the sinner's prayer, don't get wrong here. But then, then, you know, you just hang on now and hope you make heaven someday, and then you get to go to heaven, and that's your goal. As if nothing in between there really matters. But beloved, can I share with you something today? God created us to bear fruit. That's why man was created in the first place. In the very beginning, when he created Adam and Eve, what was the first thing he told them? The very first word that God spoke to them was, be fruitful and multiply. And some people think, get confused and think be fruitful and multiply is the same thing. No, we, those are two different things. The purpose of my life and the purpose of your life is to be fruitful. That's why we were created. We were not created to just say a sinner's prayer and hang on to Jesus and hope we make heaven someday and not matter what happens in between those two times. God created us to bear fruit. As a matter of fact, after he judged the world and he, he kind of reestablished things with Noah and his family, the first thing he told Noah was what? Be fruitful. The very first thing he told him was be fruitful. When God changed Jacob's name to Israel, the first thing he said to them, be fruitful. John chapter 15, what's God saying to us? Be fruitful. Be fruitful. So I, I'm not created just to live life the way I want to live it. I'm not created just to do what I want to do in life. I'm not created just to hang on until I get to go to heaven. I am created, and you are created, beloved, to be fruit-bearing individuals, to glorify the Father in this life that we live. Our life is to glorify God. Our life is to bring glory to God. You see, that's very serious because if we look at verse 2, we get into something here we need to give consideration to. Now, it's not saying the preaching is teaching this message today to, to heavy up on you, but I, I know what the Spirit of God is speaking here. Look at verse 2. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Wow, that doesn't sound good. That's not much shouting, is it? Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Now, I'll be honest with you. A lot of people who preach a sermon would skip over that. It would be easy just to move on and say, let's not deal with that. But does the Word of God say that? Does the Word of God say that every branch that doesn't bear fruit, the Father takes away? Does it say that? Let me read it again. Let me ask you this question. I don't want to understand something. I'm not making this up. Verse 2. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Does it say that? So then it ought to be important that we understand about bearing fruit, don't it? I don't want to be a branch that's taken away from you. And I'm going to get into this a little bit this morning. Beloved, there's this... Such as casual attitude in the body of Christ in the United States about our walk with God. And we, I think we've been lulled to sleep to the degree that we think that our relationship with God and our walk with God that we can be very presumptuous about. And we say, yeah, I know. I, I prayed the sinner's prayer 20 years ago and, and, and you know, I know as a kid, but I meant it. And, and you know, I just, I, I've lived my life how I wanted to live ever since then. And obviously I couldn't show you one bit of fruit that I've ever bore or produced in my life for God, but I just wait to go to heaven someday. And, oh, glory to God! Can I share with you that that's not in the Bible? That concept of Christianity does not line up with God's word. Can I share with you that that, that, that verse I read there that where Jesus said, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, the Father taketh away, is written by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And that's the words of God. And I think maybe it would behoove the body of Christ to, to kind of heed those words a little bit. I think it might be to our benefit that we stop and consider those words this morning of what God really means there. That if, if it's true that, that we need to be fruit-bearing Christians in our walk with God, and we need to know that. And maybe there, there is some kind of slumber that's come over the body of Christ, and some kind of spiritual slumber that's kind of dimmed our eyes a little bit. And we just think we can go 
along for this casual ride? I said, go back to Kentucky. God told Adam, be fruitful. God told Noah, be fruitful. God told Jacob, as he's changing his name to Israel, be fruitful. God tells the church, be fruitful. And you know what? Right after he told Adam that, he told him how to do it. Adam, be fruitful. He said, now I'm giving you all these seeds. I'm giving you all these seeds. You see, if you think an ant ain't grown garden, and how am I going to do that? Here's your seeds. <clears throat> now, whether or not Andy plants those seeds, whether or not Andy cares for those seeds, whether or not Andy watches over those seeds and protects those seeds is up to his discretion. See, he can take those seeds and put them in his garage and sit home and say, well, God told me to bear fruit, but I'm doing the best I can and I'm not bearing any fruit. You see, there's different ways that God gave us. It, it, this is a, God, in the natural we have seeds, don't we? I mean, in the natural, that's how we eat. Everything you eat comes from a seed. Well, it used to. Now it's just a bunch of chemicals. Now we got Twinkies don't throw them seeds. Uh, <laughs> sorry for all the Twinkies. <laughs> Everything that we're supposed to eat comes from the seed. Mm -hmm. Some of the other stuff we eat, man, should mix chemicals together. Call it food, but it's really not food. Uh, but in the natural, we have seeds to grow, to grow crops. We have seeds to grow vegetables. Animal life is continued on by seeds. And in the spiritual, there's seeds, isn't there? The Word of God is referred to as a seed in Mark chapter 4, when the sower goes forth to sow. What does he sow? He sows the Word, which later on is told us it's a seed. The Bible tells us in, in, in 1 Peter that we are saved, aren't we? How? By not a corruptible seed, but an incorruptible seed, which is the Word of God. And so we know that in the natural we we're fruitful by planting seeds. In a spiritual realm, we're fruitful by planting seeds. The Bible refers to money as a seed, doesn't it? 2 Corinthians chapter 9, we're told that money is a seed, and as we plant that money, that it'll multiply. So it's not a mystery how to be fruitful. We put the Word of God in our heart, we watch over the Word of God, we protect the Word of God, and it bears fruit. Amen? Hallelujah. Why don't we all stand up for just a second? Praise God. Just worship God for a minute. Everybody stand up and worship God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Come on. Come on. Everybody stand up and worship God. Come on. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Why don't we stand up and praise God? He's worthy of our praise, isn't he? He's worthy of our worship. Amen. He's worthy of our glory. Hallelujah.
We plant the word of God in a community, don't we? That's what we call evangelism. We go out, we share God's word. We, sit, we the sower goes forth to sow the seed. Amen? And it bears fruit. So God hasn't left it mysterious here about how to bear fruit. We know how to bear fruit. So God didn't leave us hanging here. But I want to share something with you. Go to verse 6. And I'm really kind of surprised that the Lord led me in this direction with this. I really was. Um, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men that gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Does that sound good? It's important, beloved, that we bear fruit. And, and I want to share something with you this morning. That, why does God, why do you take a branch off of a vine and throw it into a fire as a gardener? I mean, we don't break this down to the details. Say, well, first of all, it's not bearing fruit. Why is a branch not bearing fruit? If you have a vine out there, and you have 20 branches on there, and 19 of those branches are bearing fruit, and one's not, it's dead. It's dead. It's a dead branch. A branch has died on the vine. Keep that thought in mind. A branch has died on the vine. The branch didn't die because it's separated from the vine. A branch has died on the vine. You see, beloved, one of the things that, that, that the Lord is just, this last week, the Lord is, every time I open this up and the Lord speaks to me about this, it's just stirred me up so much. I mean, we've got to understand something. You have to do certain things to stay alive, don't you? You have to, you have to be able to eat, don't you? You have to be able to drink water, don't you? I mean, imagine this. Imagine that every time that the table was laid before you, and you went and sit down, and I'm not picking on anybody, I'm just using this as an example, you went and sat down at the table and fell asleep, didn't you? What would happen? Eventually, you're going to die, aren't you? It's not because food's not available. It's because you choose not to partake of the nutrients. It's not because water's not available, but you choose not to partake of the nutrients. You see, you can be a branch on the vine, and for some reason that branch is not partaking of the nutrients. The nutrients are there because all the other branches are alive. The nutrients are there because all the other branches are doing well. All the other branches are bearing fruit. But there's that one that did not receive the nutrients, and it died on the vine, and the, and the gardener comes along and looks at it and thinks, well, something's wrong with that branch. Look at that. It's died, he breaks it off and casts it to the side. Because it has died on the vine. So you see what I'm trying to get at. To maintain life, we have to have God's word, don't we? To maintain life, we have to partake of God's spirit, don't we? You see, that's something that is, is greatly just greatly, greatly endangering the body of Christ, beloved, that we think that eternal life can be sustained without doing any kind of maintenance with it. That we think that we can live without the Word of God. That we think we can live without prayer. That we think we can live without worship. We think we can live without being watered by the Holy Spirit. We think we can be casual about our walk with God and just act, treat those things if there's some casual thing on the side. But beloved, there are the very things that sustain our life and keep us from dying on the vine. Yeah. Oh, stop here, so I'll settle down a little bit. We can die on the vine. Am I making this up? Is that what the Bible says? No. Jesus said, this is eternal life. That you might know me. Know me implies an active, ongoing relationship. I 
as I was thinking about that, one thing that hit me, I, I talk about Mary and Martha all the time. And there's one word Jesus used in that example that just jumped out at me. You see, we know that at Mary and Martha, they were there, and Martha was the one that was covered about many things, and she's going around doing all this different stuff, and busy about this, and worried about this, and Mary's sitting at the feet of Jesus. And Martha begins to complain, Jesus, don't you care that my sister's sitting there at your feet while I'm doing all the work? What did Jesus say then? There's one word there that, that I think they have really ju I've jumped over several times. This, that is, which is most needful. That which she needs. That which she has to have. That which can't be taken from her, she is doing. In other words, her priorities are right. She knows what she needs. She needs to sit here in my presence and hear my word. She needs that. It doesn't say she wants it. She desires it. She has a hunger for it. She has a thirst for it. It's that which she needs. You see, I think it would change our, our concept of what we do tremendously if we would understand something, that this word is not something that, that is nice to hear. This is what you need to stay alive. That the moving of the Holy Spirit is not just something that's a nice goosebump, but it's what you need to stay alive. Your prayer life is what you need to stay alive. Your worship life is what you need to stay alive. Yes, so that you don't die on the vine. That's what's needful. And we've kind of got into that mentality somehow or another where we, we look at church activity as a nice convenience, not that which we need. I believe it was Job who said he esteemed the word of God more so than even than food. This is more important to you than eating. The moving of the Holy Spirit is more important to you than drinking wine. If you have a choice, should I eat or read a Bible, you better read the Bible. Got a choice, should I, should I spend my time drinking water? Or should I where worship him and get into his presence? You better get into his presence. You see, there's something we need to grasp here. We need to grasp the difference between need and want. You don't want to go to church. You need to go to church. You don't want to read the Bible. You need to read the Bible. You don't want to pray. You need to pray. You don't want to worship. You need to worship. You don't want to be in the moving of the Holy Spirit. You need to be in the moving of the Holy Spirit. It puts a completely different twist upon it. That, that song that we sing, He's Keeping Me Alive, we need to understand the reality of that. I come to Jesus, I'm born again. I abide in his presence and he keeps me alive. Hallelujah. I don't want to be a vine or a branch that dies on the vine. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise you, Pastor. Amen. Romans chapter 11. You don't have to turn there, but just for the future reference. God gives us the example of Israel dying on the vine. And that we are grafted in. And when we are grafted in, the warning in Romans chapter 11 is that because of unbelief, that branch was taken away. Because of unbelief, that branch withered on the vine. It was taken away. And we should take heed of that and be sure that the same thing doesn't happen to us. Because the same way that, that unbelief caused them to wither and die on the vine, unbelief will cause us to wither and die on the vine. Yes. Yes. I know the same shot. Go home, what you learn, church? Oh, the right guy on the line. Maybe we need to wake up. Maybe we need to open our eyes. Maybe we need to open our ears. We realize what we need. I'm, I'm winding down here. Come to a conclusion here. One very important point, brother, that I'm going to challenge you with today. I am a true vine, and my father is a husband. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Now, I'm going to ask a question here. And I'm not even going to ask that of us. But I'm going to ask that a future rep for, 
There are people who watch this on the internet, and there are people who will hear this on the CD. So, whoever hears this, I want to ask them a deep theological question. Because there's a lot of people who will say, no, Pastor, what you preach is not correct. Those, those branches weren't really Christians. They weren't really saved. They weren't really born again. They were just false professors. And I, I got an open challenge for anybody who says that. Let me read this verse again. <coughs> abide in me and I in you as a branch. Cannot bear fruit except itself. So abide in my books. Verse 2. For every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. I got a deep theological challenge for anybody who wants to disagree with me on this. You find somewhere else in the New Testament where in me means somebody who's not saved. It's used, I think, by the Apostle Paul 107 times, and every time it's referring to a Christian. Explain to me theologically how you can be in Jesus and not be saved. In me means you're born again. In me means you're a Christian. In me means you're a relationship. In me means you're a born again Christian. There's no other way. You go to the book of Ephesians. In me, in Christ, in whom, in him, all of those phrases refer to what we have in Christ. Everywhere that phrase is used in the New Testament, it refers to Christians. And some people say they're a dumb. So they're trying to convince me that 169 times, it means one thing, and here it means something different, so it'll suit their theology. Examine the word. Just a thought, I just had to lay that out. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So in me means they have to be a new creation. So it's possible to be born again, to be a new creation, and to not to partake of the spiritual nutrients that we need, and to die on the vine. Now I'm going to go to another scripture. You with me so far? First Timothy. I keep hearing a Bob Dylan song in my head. I won't sing it, I promise. <laughs> he did a song. When you go on the wake up. And I hear that in the spirit of God. When we go on the wake up. <coughs> when we go on the wake up. <coughs> when we go on the And I'm not talking physically. You need to wake up physically before you wake up spiritually. You see, the other reason that I believe, and, and I've asked God, Lord, why is that so heavy in my heart? I've never preached that message. I've never taught that message. Anytime I've ever went, went through John chapter 15 and, and, and did any preaching or teaching on it, I've always went a completely different direction and talked about abiding and, and dwelling and having a relationship with him. I've never once, in all of my years of preaching and teaching, looked at the branches that had died on the vine. And, and it wasn't just that the Lord seemed to be leading me in that direction. But the way he did it was such an urgency upon my heart. And such a heaviness. It's like, Lord, why? And when I asked him that, he led me to this scripture. And, and, and I want you to listen very closely to this scripture. 1 Timothy chapter 4. Verse number 1. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times, would that be now, you think? The last of the last days? Probably are, aren't we? Some shall depart from the faith. Some shall die on the vine. Giving heed to seducing spirits, and doctrines of devils. Now let me ask you a question. How does a Christian get deceived like that? What happens? That we go from abiding in Christ, born again, shout glory to the Lord, to departing from the faith and giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. I mean, in all honesty, if I came around to you and, and I said, you know, hi, uh, glad to meet you, Paul, I'm the devil, and I got some advice for you, come follow me, Paul, let's go do this crazy stuff. I mean, you wouldn't fall for that, would you? If I came to you and said, you know, why don't you 
just reject Jesus? You wouldn't fall for that, would you? Why don't you just denounce God? You wouldn't fall for that, would you? But it says here, some shall. Some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Where do you hear doctrine at? Where did you hear a doctrine of a devil? How are you going to hear doctrine in church? And the word doctrine means teaching. Well, let me look at this. What you say? It says here, expressly, manifestly, specified, and stated terms. In other words, Paul is saying the Spirit of God has spoken to this baby powerfully and plainly to give warning that in the last days, there's going to be a problem in the body of Christ and people shall depart from the faith because of seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And I've always looked at that and, and, and kind of like, Lord, how would that happen? What happens to the heart of a believer that they would turn from Christ? As a matter of fact, that word depart means simply to separate. How would a seducing spirit or doctrine of devils get us to separate from Christ? As a matter of fact, go to Hebrews chapter 3. Let me show you one more thing before we wrap this up. I want some grasp this. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12 and 13. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief and departing from the living God. Listen to what the Word of God says in the next verse. But exhort one another daily. How often? Daily. daily. While it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. So it's saying there that this is such a concern that we are to take heed, even amongst ourselves, and exhort one another daily, every single day. Because it can sneak in and happen so quickly. We need to be concerned about this every day day of our life. And we need to concern about our brothers and sisters in Christ every day of their life. That we are to warn them and exhort them that this doesn't happen to them. So, can, would, I, would, you, would you agree with me then that apparently God sees this as a far greater threat than the body of Christ takes it to be? That we don't take this serious. And we, 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 we see people fall away. And we're in danger of ourselves sometimes. Because I'm going to share with you how this happens. You remember I just shared with you. About we need the word of God. We need the spirit of God. We need our spiritual nutrition. Do we not? We need that. We need that. Or else we can die on the vine. So how would seducing spirits attack us? Simply pulling us away from what we need. Simply pulling us away from our nutrition. What doctrine of devil could possibly enter in to cause us not to, not to cause us to fall away from Jesus Christ? The doctrine of the devil who says it's not important if you read the word of God. The doctrine of the devil that had made that a casual activity that some people do. The doctrine of the devil that says it's no big deal, you can love God and go to heaven and not go to church. The doctrine of the devil that says, hey, it's no big deal if the spirit's moving. The doctrine of the devil that constantly says it's not, it's not that big deal if you have a prayer line. The doctrine of the devil says it's not no big deal to worship God. The doctrine of the devil that says it's okay just to be this casual Christian. The doctrine of the devil says you don't need to work. You don't need to be in the 
this. But the body of Christ is allowed to enter their lives and pull them away from the Word of God. Pull them away from their prayer life. Pull them away from worship. Pull them away from His presence. And made it think that those are things that we do, that some people who are real religious do, and we will do at our convenience. The doctrine of the devil says you don't need those things. The doctrine of the devil says it's okay, just pray this little prayer, and in 30 years you just look like you want, you go to heaven. The doctrine of the devil says you can't die in the body. How can that happen? You see, it's interesting. Let me read you a definition of something. I didn't make it to Seducing spirits, wandering, and leading astray. You know, I think I'm going to go to Bible study tonight. Seducing spirits, that's the way I'm not going to go. Oh, I haven't seen you in so long! exhort you to examine your heart and examine your life and ask yourself this question. Are you partaking of the nutrients of God's Word? And I don't mean this to be funny, but beloved, but in all honesty, you can see this element all the time. People come to church and sit down and fall asleep and don't hear anything that's said. And go home and think, well, I go to church, I'm okay. You ain't been to church, you came here and slept. Seriously, you didn't come to church. Didn't happen. If you don't receive something, you didn't come. Hallelujah. I'm not picking on that today. I'm just using that as an example. I'm just I'm challenging you. I'm exhorting you. This morning to hear from the Spirit of God. And what he speaks. Beloved, we need to make sure that we have a vibrant ongoing relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? And get this idea out of our head that reading the Bible is some kind of religious duty. And prayer is some kind of religious duty. And worship is some kind of religious duty. That's what keeps us alive. That's the relationship that feeds us every day. Amen. Hallelujah. I know you probably ain't no shout, but I'm tempting to come to the keyboard. Hallelujah.